Good evening. <clears throat> so I have the pleasure uh, to speak as the last person today, just before the social dinner, and I will try to be fast. Uh, <laughs> well, fastish. Uh. <laughs> so I will talk about the phasing diagnostic station, basically the tool that uh, Jason and Henri will use to bring the telescope after AIV or during AIV, depending on how many segments will be in at the time. Time, let's say, as we have to have a few segments and then two, three, four, five in, and then we can start uh, to diffraction limited performance before the instruments are actually going in onto the Naismith platform. Uh, for some reason, sometimes my red dots uh, are gone. <laughs> I have no idea why and why not. I went back and forth on the PowerPoint and, and then it well, sometimes comes back. On the PDF it's like that, so think of this red dots there. My agenda is that I will introduce the phasing diagnostic station or phi station as Jason is calling it. Uh, talk uh, quickly about the user requirements uh, of them. Then what we have done in terms of uh, architectural study to figure out how we will build that uh, thing. Where we are at the current status with a concept design. We'll go back to where exactly the phasing diagnostic station will be on the telescope. Uh, and then about, they will talk about the schedule and conclude. So the use cases, as I said, uh, we have the wavefront control commissioning use case uh, that basically starting from AIV, all mirrors are to mechanical tolerances plus laser tracker tolerances. That means there will be not one star when we start uh, that, that whole phase. We will have number of segments times blobs or donuts or whatnot, okay? And they are not stacked, they're not on top of each other. In fact, uh, Henri's uh, calculations have shown they will be within a five arc minute uh, uh, torus uh, to find. So we will actually start with a screen two by two meters in the 10 arc minute field, and then we will bring the stuff together until the phasing diagnostic station will see it within the one arc minute field, which is our maximum field that we have actually available inside our um, tool. So then the phasing diagnostic uh, station actually starts to stack them really together first from one arc minute to 10 arc seconds. And then we can start using a Sheikh Hartmann to stack them such that we have one blob. You're still talking about blobs and highly aberrated three arc second stuff. So the phasing diagnostic station, although in the end we will have to do some diffraction limited stuff uh, eventually, it also has to work in this highly bad, I wouldn't say bad regime, but okay. challenging okay. regime. <laughs> challenging, <laughs> let's say stay positive. Yeah. Um, to start with. In the end, what we will do as well, then afterwards, after we have done all this waveform control commissioning and we know a bit better that part, we do a characterization uh, of some level one requirements of uh, the ELT. And in the end, this is a tool, as Jason has said, that will stay on the telescope every time there are some questions to diagnose the telescope, troubleshoot, and in addition, after some big maintenance, it is also used to recommission the whole telescope. Uh, so that screen will be at, in some bodega and we will put it back on in case needed, hopefully not. Therefore, the key stakeholders of that thing are a vast number of people, like the AME manager, Telescope scientists, wavefront control architect, these are the actual, well, the actual users, the telescope scientists and wavefront control architects. A stake in it, however, is the entire upper part of the ELT management as well. And actually, uh, in the end, during operations, it's, it's the head of parallel engineering and the ELT science operations. So, the user requirements uh, could, can be actually summarized in this very nice uh, plot from Henri, where we have in green, the pupil plane, up down, and on the, in yellow, in the very back, uh, the, the image plane. We have visible and infrared left and right. And uh, that means we will try to have as much as possible parameter space in terms of imaging, in terms of uh, wavefront sensing, in terms of going towards high order. To, be, to have a tool set that will help us to whatever we will see on the telescope, to be pre prepared as to be best prepared as possible. However, for the unknowns that we cannot foresee at the moment, 
and not to have just to throw out the PDS down the mountain and build a new one, we will have a visitor port. Uh, you know, you see it down there. And, uh, and maybe we do also laser guide star things, but this is uh, there. The visitor port is not there to do science, and this ent entire PDS is not doing any science, right? This is really to diagnose and to verify that the telescope is working before the instruments come. So you, as Jason has said this morning, uh, this afternoon, we deliver the, what we have promised to deliver, and this is our aim to do that. So uh, in order to do M1 segment capture, we have the visible imager, and as I said, with the one arc minute field, we have a diffraction-limited imager uh, with seven to 10 arc seconds uh, with five milli arc second pixels, so we can probe uh, the diffraction-limited uh, K-band uh, straddle ratio in the end. We have a Sheck Hartman phasing. That is the one that uh, we have on sky experience with using the GTC. In addition, the CAC and GTC, is, that's the one working. Phasing is done these, uh, these days there. That's why this, uh, it's a no brainer. This has to be in. This has some disadvantages, um, as we have seen and, uh, during the, our time on the GTC when we did the phasing. And, and just to, uh, to help with that, we added the Fernica phase contrast as a very robust phasing sensor um, to help with this. In addition, we have a lower order Sheck Hartmann uh, sensor to do SCAO in the early stages and during the commissioning. Afterwards, when we, do, when we go very, uh, to, to verify the strail ratio of 70% 70, 70 is in the end what, we need, uh, what the telescope is promised to do, that we will use the pyramid and the infrared uh, diffraction limited imager to do this. Um, the auto might change uh, how we do things on the mountain, but this is what we do. And as I said, for the characterization of the telescope, uh, the seeing limited performance uh, has to be uh, characterized. Pointing, offset, we talked about this morning. Nodding, with the several uh, tools we have available, we are um, fairly certain that we can verify the telescope and, um, and characterize so we know what it is. And as that fourth point here on the, uh, is the instrument CCS interface. The PDS uses the exact same interface as all instruments as well. So we will test this interface. We will only communicate to M4 and let the telescope do, uh, do the rest with the offloading and making sure uh, we always have enough uh, actuator space available on M4 when we do the thing. Of course, we are doing phasing. In the fa phasing use case, yes, we do have the, um, another range to do, but this has nothing to do with the characterization, right? There we use the instrument interface as designed and we will test it before the instruments are coming. As that, we have the visitor optical port for risk mitigation, free for the moment, and when, if we see there's something happening, we have uh, yeah, possibility. And uh, as you all know, we have the melt test bench uh, up and running. Actually, you don't know that, but hopefully in two, three weeks, it is actually up and running. And, uh, and, and we will use it now in the next five years to develop uh, wavefront control commission, commissioning um, scenarios, templates that we are actually quite prepared uh, when the DLT is there. In addition, we, we can also test this whole other uh, interface to the CCS because MELT is running on the ELT uh, uh, central control system as well. So during the PDS architectural study, there's a slide without the red dots again. We, we started with uh, three candidate architectures. And with architecture, I mean, how do we, these six sensors that we have, we have the visible imager and infrared imager, we have the lower order Sheck Hartmann, we have the Sheck Hartmann facing, Zeus, and the pyramid, K-band, H-band, visible, as I've seen, uh, shown in this nice plot from Marie before. So how to orient them best possible? So we had the, and, these oriented ones are invented. Uh, the names are actually coming from Enrico, and I like them. We like them very much, so that's why they are here. It's the wavelength-oriented uh, architecture we had, an instrument-oriented uh, um, architecture, and a wavefront sensor-oriented. They are actually quite similar because they are strongly driven by these user requirements to have these sensors on board. But they were placed differently with beam splitters in different places, and in the end, uh, we evaluated and compared them based on some defined criteria before. Our uh, criteria were driven by 
ease of integration, assembly, and calibration, and ease in cost and schedule. They were certainly not driven by performance. We, we do just enough to meet the performance requirements. We will meet the performance requirements, but we don't do more. We are not photon starved. If we, if, if we need a, a brighter star, we just go to a brighter star. That's, that, that's our, uh, it's already complex uh, enough to build the system as it is, so uh, that, that, is, that, is, that is where we can gain a bit uh, back. So, and here you see now the, uh, um, the, the architecture that has been uh, selected. It's the instrument-oriented one where basically light is going directly from the left to the uh, acquisition and guide camera. This is the visible imager, the one arc minute field, which is mechanically derotated and only 10 arc, the 10 arc second field of U2, which is at most needed by the other wavefront sensors, is reflected out. One, one design driver was that uh, the Schick-Hartmann facing sensor, it's called still Shaps here from the Ape times, uh, and um, I know I'm, you never should do this starting a project and not have the correct names. So maybe they will stick or not. Uh, this is a mistake. Uh, it will stick, unfortunately, no. So anyway, uh, Shaps is only getting reflected light. And uh, I, I talked about uh, that Shaps has some um, shortcomings already seen in the GTC and in the Zeus, and this is the pupil registration. Shaps uses um, sub-apertures across the edges that, are, that need to stay on one side and on, the, on, on one segment, on the other segment, not to be influenced by the edge effects of uh, polishing, which is, I think, a millimeter in the ELT. We have a four millimeter gap. The two slits, at least uh, on the GTC, and we, we will use this baseline lens slit uh, are four centimeters away. That means two centimeters on each segment minus that gap and edge effects. In the end, what it means is we, are, we have almost a requirement of 10 to the minus 4. That means 10 to the minus 2% pupil motion is at most what we can uh, tolerate. That is, for a lens slit of 4 centimeters in the PDS, 4 microns is the maximum we can allow before the, the, that signal goes away. Of course, we have a pupil stabilization mirror, of but we need to sense it using photometric sub-apertures around chaps. We hope that works, in, or we use uh, the Cernicke phase contrast to sense or help sensing it, and then we have to see uh, how we do that. In any way, uh, the registration and the stabilize and, uh, is quite something. That's why Sharps only gets reflected light and no transmitted light to keep the aberrations as low as possible. Then we have the other visible one uh, going to the Sheck-Hartmann AO. In the end, it's actually. 90-10 is the other way around, as Enrico has calculated uh, just uh, last week. Um, Zeus will get uh, J and H band um, uh, for the Cernicke phase contrast. And then we, uh, at, uh, on the left side uh, and downwards, we have an infrared imager and a pyramid uh, also working in K band. The infrared imager is getting J, H band, so in the end we can do some PR images in a J and H and K band uh, as well. Whether this field derotator is really in, and we have to align uh, poor AIV guys, uh, pupil derotator and field derotator, we have, we have to, there's some discussion going on uh, with our users. I see now that Mavis has the same uh, principle, but uh, oh. a, a derotator alone is already very hard to align, and then two, to, to merge two rotational axes, <clears throat> yes. Yes. Um, just, uh, uh, okay, you've got uh, these uh, IR bike rays, so that means that uh, the element of part of the flux in the pipe goes to just how, how many of them? Well, in this architecture that was the very early on, we have the, the uh, in terms of simultaneity, which wavefront sensors have to run, or which imager or what, have to run in the same time. Not all, not all have to do that in the same time, so, it, it, uh, so that means... In this one, we, we have said, okay, we can put a mirror in to get all the light there, but, but actually we have seen maybe that is not needed and we want to have the least moving parts. This is a robust system, as simple as possible, so if, our, if we can go to a brighter star and therefore throw some light away, uh, we'd rather do this. Uh, we are at the beginning of the preliminary design. Brighter star is better than function. Yeah, I, I mean... 
This is not the science uh, tool, so we don't have modes and uh, stuff. There's already enough complexity anyway to do this. Um, it's, so it's an on-axis system, one natural guide star for all or for some of the sensors, so the simultaneity. Um, so we will, have, we will run some very stringent use cases which sensor really has to run at what time. And maybe all of them run at the same time, and we, and then, but then we have to check the background and, the, and how long we need to integrate to get to the signal to noise needed for the sensor to drive all that. So um, infrared imager and pyramid are very close to reduce the non-common path errors because in the end, 70% straling K-band is also what we, or what we sh uh, have to show because this is what is promised uh, and we have the visitor focus, I showed that. So just to give you an idea, to, to input to our designers, I've put uh, some version zero block diagram so it's a modular approach, as you can see. I don't, don't, I don't expect you to read like the small things. It's, you can see eight different uh, boxes. Re, resemble like the, 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 the six sensors, a beam relay and a calibration source at the beginning. Uh, yeah. And here's a concept design, optical design. This is not yet the final one. There's, uh, for example, a one-to-one re-imaging um, optics uh, still missing for the shops and whatnot. Uh, our design volume is T-shaped. On this top side is where M1 is, and we have no access. It's only 18 centimeters currently where the cable wrap of, M, uh, of the telescope starts. So, uh, and you see the visible image is mechanically rotated by only by 180 degrees. That's enough. Uh, we will always go back to another star if that will be the end of the story. And this is the Codé train. We are, we are using the light from the Codé mirror. So we have to clear that eventually. I mean, I guess in the next 20 years, there's no other Codé... Uh, instrument coming nevertheless. Mechanically, we, we, we are able to remove the whole blue uh, optical stuff around so to clear out the Coudé train. Uh, and this is actually, might actually be quite nice for maintenance anyway if you rotate the visible imager to, the, to this way here and then, then we move it out. Uh. Where are we? Uh, you see here from the telescope the beam coming to M6C, which on the left side is not uh, deployed. So this is the configuration where you guys get the light, and uh, so the PFS is already installed when we come on the mountain, but we start, of, of course, on axis, and as soon as we, we know on axis roughly what's going on, we will try to get also the sensor arms, but this is on JSON, how to do this and when. Anyway, uh, the one arc minute field is brought down to this T-shaped place, and this is why we have to do also a modular approach, because the PFS is installed when we start installing on the Naismith platform. So we have to <coughs> do this uh, uh, in a modular approach. Um, we will go in uh, for doing maintenance via METIS. There's a 1.2 meter pathway going through and uh, they have worked very hard to keep that free for us and have arranged the cabinet such that, we, that this is our normal way to go in to this uh, area. So we are in preliminary design now. We started uh, just in September with it. At the moment, we're doing some performance analysis, so exactly the Jack Hartman facing and Cernicke phase contrast studies in detail in order. So the question is not that we, how, and we know how to face in principle, but the question is, is there anything that would drive the optical design at this very moment or not? I mean, in the preliminary design, of course, there will be more studies to be done throughout the next years. But what I'm asking at the moment is if there's some common zoom where we have to put you know, three uh, triplets uh, in a completely different place, these are the questions that I would like to know now uh, rather than yeah, the sooner the better. Yeah. And then, of course, we, we, we extend this via sensitivity analysis throughout the optics in, uh, in the PDS for the optomechanics to understand what sensitivity do we need to know, and then this with a realistic telescope beam with tolerances starting with crap, but also with a very nice beam uh, at the end of uh, commissioning. And this is all input to all for the optical design. And as I said, the Sheikh Hartman uh, is, of course, with the experience we have uh, that's in. So currently, it's an iterative phase where optics, mechanics, AIV have a lot of saying, systems engineering is putting in uh, in, in addition, we do detector control system uh, structure definition and overall control system definition. You can imagine it's not just the interface, the, the, just <laughs> the instrument interface that we have to do, but also how do we actually control this beast, uh, I mean the PDS. B. 
yeast. Uh, but with melt, we will do this uh, uh, with the you know, help of melt, uh, we will get to that as well. So our design driver, as I've said, is we want to have a robust system. On the mountain, I, we do not want to think about is this working? Is the filter wheel really moving to this or whatnot? I mean, we have so many problems to get the telescope running. Not problems, but challenges. Um, <laughs> problems is okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. but, but certainly the PDS should just deliver images and, and provide the toolbox of, uh, so we can get this thing up and running. And I said the schedule and cost are very important. I mean, we need to be there on time. This is, this is clear, and also the cost uh, is uh, always, uh, we have to stay in cost uh, the same. Maintainability, integratability is, of course, very important. Of course, we will meet the required needs, but that's enough. Yeah? There's no science, and we are not photon-starved. Uh, yeah. And here we are getting now a bit more. You see, because we do have an infrared imager in the K-band, this, of course, does require uh, um, 80 Kelvin uh, cryostat, otherwise we just have background and nothing else. It's, it's like you, during commissioning. <laughs> <laughs> during commissioning, the thing, the thing runs and we are just in the control room. No, <laughs> so the answer is no, it's not me. <laughs> so, but, but we are thinking about maintainability already starting from now, that, that's clear, yeah. So you see also the large uh, dichroic that uh, spits out the 10 arc seconds uh, horizontally while the visible image gets uh, some 10% or whatever uh, of the light down. Um, and you see the rails, how to, how to clear out the codet. There will be no motor, that's for sure. I mean, in 20 years, that motor will fail anyway uh, if, if that has to be done on a regular basis. So this will be a manual maintenance mode right now. And, uh, and uh, yeah, you can see now in the back, uh, do you see, oh yeah. So this, this here, this is the cryostat for the infrared uh, imager here in the back. This is the this Freda design vol volume for the pyramid. The pyramid is most likely not cooled, as the current uh, uh, calculations, background calculations have shown. Um, we have this uh, first pupil derotator here. You see the motor, though, so it's feasible to put that motor there. The pupil tip tilt mirror is at here in the ELT focal plane. So this is the actual ELT F17.7 focal plane. And then we split the light into, in this case here, that it's Soyuz. This is the near infrared up to H-band. Shafts will be in the red part of the visible. And here we have the Sheik Hartmann AO. And then here, this is the visitor site where there will be some design volume, and that's it. Uh, So just, uh, I'm, you see, I am influenced by this guy there. I start to do the same as well. But uh, that was actually quite nice to actually communicate to our designers how, because that it didn't fit. You saw that like, all these design volumes were just at the end of our design volume. And to, uh, to get a better grasp, also with our optical designers and mechanical designers, we started a painting session. And that what was coming out where there's some features like uh, focal planes, pupil planes needed, uh, whatnot. Um, <coughs> And uh, yeah, just saying that. So the project phase is, it's basically a five-year thing. We started just last month with the kickoff of the preliminary design phase, one year. That means um, by the end of August, all documentation should be ready. And we have early October next year PDR. A year later in October 2021 is FDR, and then we have three-year MAIT. <laughs> Tim was just taking a photo and probably <laughs> showing me that. Uh, Who's taking a photo? <laughs> <laughs> You're being videoed anyway. Yeah, yeah. Really yeah. <laughs> so, so that, oh, oh, by the way, Tim, Tim, just uh, if you talk about instruments, we have 30 FTEs to do that kind of thing in house, not 500, 300, I don't know what you guys have. <coughs> anyway, so it's one year, MIT. <coughs> Excuse me. No, no. It's one year of procurement and manufacturing, and that probably means that we have to have an optics FDR before the actual FDR for procurement times. Um, one year of subsystem assembly, and that goes into the uh, 
that that goes into the, the direction of we are building a modular thing because we have to integrate it anyway inside the PFS. So we do first sub system assembly and test and then one year of uh, system assembly and December 2024 shipment and then the first few months uh, in uh, 2025 is uh, uh, installation on first in the uh, IAA and then on the uh, Naismith platform and then some verification before it will be used. So in, to conclude, the PDS supports wavefront control commissioning, system verification, diagnostics, troubleshooting during the regular operations and recommissioning. So it's a vast amount of requirements. It's the tool that brings the ELT to the diffraction limit for the first time. And uh, we have now a baseline architecture and are currently in the preliminary design phase uh, and the PDS system responsibilities in-house. Whether we do everything in-house or, um, or we buy some sub-parts uh, that uh, we will uh, decide on a case-by-case uh, -case basis, uh, at the moment it looks like we do in that. Maybe the visible imager is a standalone thing that could be outsourced, uh, um, but we'll see. And I'm, I'm closing with this and thank you very much.